Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Good morning. All right. If I'm speaking louder than normal, it's because I still cannot hear from yesterday uh, at our great men's firing fellowship. Uh, my name is Nathan, and I have the uh, privilege of welcoming everyone this morning to Harbin's Community Baptist Church. Um, it is a good day to be here. We're going to be celebrating some wonderful things. Uh, regenerate heart. We're going to celebrate uh, the empty tomb and our risen Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm glad you're here this morning. If you are a visitor here, uh, which looks like the vast majority of you are, uh, if you are so inclined, there should be a visitor card in the seat backs in front of you. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about Harbin's or what we believe here and those kinds of things, fill that out and you can drop it in one of the baskets up here or there's a black box by the rear doors back there. You can drop it in there. Uh, you should also see in the seat back in front of you a blue slip. Uh, this is for prayer requests. If there's anything that's on your heart, uh, whether a request or a praise, anything like that, feel free to fill that out and you can place it in the basket up here. And somebody's going to throughout the service or at the end of the service, um, somebody will come up there, we can grab that and we can pray for one another. Uh, that's a great way where uh, us as a church can pray for one another and give praise to God for things that we are thankful for. So a few announcements for today. Uh, we are still looking for some volunteers uh, for the sound booth. Uh, we are, I don't want to say desperate need for somebody to help run audio uh, but we are desperate for someone to help us run audio. So if you are so inclined uh, to serve in that capacity, if you feel called by the Lord to do that, um, come see one of the elders and we will point you in the right direction to get you hooked up with that. Uh, we are also looking for anybody that is interested in teaching any of the kids' classes for Sunday school this year. Uh, we had um, people from last year, if you're still interested in doing that again this year, if you can come to talk to one of us um, and get some more information on that. Uh, classes will be starting back up in a few weeks, so we're looking for some um, people there. Uh, we did it uh, this Sunday. We'll be doing it again next Sunday and then every Sunday after that, but we have pre-service prayer. Uh, so each Sunday at 1015, we gather up here and we just pray for the service, uh, pray over the service, pray for those on their way, pray for God to be glorified in the preaching of his word. Um, so make that to be a point to be here every Sunday because it's a good time for us to gather together and pray corporately. Uh, there is also a members meeting today right after the service. Uh, so we'll start uh, 15 minutes about after the service starts. Um, so any members or regular attenders, if you're interested in participating in any of the fall classes that we have coming up for Sunday school and our community groups and things like that, please stick around. Um, it'll be hopefully a quick meeting, uh, but that'll be uh, time for everybody to get some information. And in the meantime, with that, I have been told that there is an impromptu meal downstairs. So if you're not a member or regular attender, you can go ahead and head down there uh, after the service will be out these doors and down this hallway and down the stairs, just follow the smell. And if you are a member and you want to stick around, there is plenty of food. And at the end, we'll dismiss and everybody can just go down there. Uh, the Max Amigos are providing that. So feel free to impromptu fall in with that. Um, also, Andrea made cake pops. And I have been told explicitly to, if you are a child, this is for a back to school um, enjoyment for some cake pops. You have to get permission from your parents to have one. And you can come see her after the service is concluded and she will give you a cake pop. So only children who are going back to school who have permission from their parents and approach her after service can get a cake pop. So kids, pay attention during the service, honor the Lord in listening to his word and then enjoy a sweet afterward. Also, finally, men's prayer next Sunday, August 14th, 6.30, we'll meet out there in the chairs out in the lobby. Uh, it's a great time. We'll read through Psalm 70. Seven. Uh, finally, remember which one we're, we're going through next. Uh, but we'll read through the psalm, pray over the psalm, pray with one another. It's a great time to build up, edify one another by going through the word. Um, so men, make a point of that on your calendars next Sunday at 630. Uh, wives, make sure to make an appointment on your calendar as well so that you can make sure that your husbands are there as well. So I think that is everything. Um, and as I said earlier, we are here to do something very important, and that is to worship a holy God. Uh, so I'm sure we've come with many things on our minds and our hearts this week. So let's take a moment to quiet our hearts and um, prepare ourselves for worship this morning.
Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 54. O oh God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. O oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eyes looked in triumph on my enemies. Let's pray. Father, I'm very thankful this morning to be gathered with brothers and sisters in Christ to approach your throne this morning, to worship you, to offer up praise to you, to hear your truth preached and proclaimed to us today. I pray that you'll prepare us today, prepare our hearts, open our hearts and our minds to hear your truths, to worship you um, in a humble way, um, to convict us of any sin that we have so that we can approach you rightly. I pray that you will be with us today as we endeavor in that pursuit. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So please stand. We're going to start off with singing, Come Praise and Glorify. Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us poor. For pure and blameless in His sight, He destined us to be. And now we've been adopted through His Son eternally. To the praise of Your glory, to the praise of Your mercy and grace, to the praise. should be the head of all his purpose to fulfill to the praise of your glory to the praise of your mercy and grace to the praise The Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit guarantees our hope until redemption's done. Until we join in endless praise to God the Three. do a responsive reading um, from Luke 11, verses 1 through 4. This is the Lord's Prayer, so if you'll join me in reading this together. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, 
One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, pray like this. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. All right, you can have a seat um, as we do this uh, baptism. Well, good morning, everyone. Lots of faces, lots of friends, lots of family. We love all you guys, and we're so happy that you're here to share this time with us. It truly is a joy. I mean, we have eight children, and this is the first one to be baptized, and I'm just so happy and thankful that I'm the one that gets to do it. <sighs> Anyways. <laughs> I just want to briefly talk about what baptism is, and then I can share some of Mark's story and then Mark can share some of his story too. But here in these waters, there's really nothing special in these waters. This right here, and I love how like Harbin's here has this picture frame around this baptismal. This is a picture of something that has already happened in the Mark of Life. And he wants to make a public profession of that to all of you guys. And we're so glad that all of y'all are here to see that. I want to read from the book of Romans. Before that, when I say there's nothing special in this waters, I just want to give an example from the Bible. Naaman, the leper, the Syrian, who was sent to the Jordan River to be washed in it, to be cleansed of his leprosy. There was nothing special in that water. He recognized it. I'm sure even the man of God recognized it. But he was given a command. He was told by the man of God to go into the waters. And baptism, I would say, is also a command that the Lord has given us. And the Lord has told us, go into the nations, discipling them, baptizing them in the name of Jesus. So really what you're seeing here today, Mark's not going to be changed when he walks back out of these waters. Mark has already been changed and saved by God. Amen. And, and we can rejoice in that. And now he's just making this public to you guys. I want to read from the book of Romans. I hope I don't drop my Bible. I was told I should have borrowed Peter's waterproof Bible. <laughs> But uh, if I drop it, I'll grab another one to preach from. But yeah, Romans chapter 6, I'm just going to read verses 1 through 11. And I think this really talks about the heart of baptism and what we believe it to be. Romans chapter 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And that word likeness, it could be translated as image, a picture. What you're seeing here is a picture of something that's happened. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So, Mark, you can come on down here. Mark is our oldest son. He's 16. You probably know him as the kid that plays piano and you really only see the back of his head. You're finally getting to get to see his face. <laughs> he's the one that's climbing on the building. He's not cleaning gutters. He just likes to jump around up there, and that's where he's comfortable. But, like... Mark is a believer. He's a brother in Christ. Amen. Amen. 
out of all accomplishments in his life, he didn't accomplish this. But God did it for him. I rejoice in that today. <sighs> he was saved around the age of eight. I was working and he called me. Dad, you'd never believe what happened. <laughs> and he told me he was saved the night before. He had read the scriptures with his mother. And he had come to know that he was a sinner that needed a savior. And God saved him. And now he's making that profession public. So praise the Lord for that. Mark, can you share a little bit about your testimony? And we can testify to that. Just seeing Mark grow over the years has been amazing. Not just the fact that he gets to, you know, to, to worship here on stage uh, and lead you guys, help lead you guys in worship. That's just one element of it. But just even seeing his desire for the Word of God, seeing the way his interactions with his family members have changed over the years as God has continued to grow him and build him up. We can testify to that. I just have a couple questions to ask Mark in the presence of all you guys. And Mark, if you can answer them. And uh, we'll proceed. Uh, Mark, are you fully trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation and realizing that there is nothing you can do or nothing you will ever do to gain that salvation on your own? Yeah, I am. And do you agree to follow God with a good conscience, devoting time to just reading the Bible, praying to God, growing, helping others here to grow in Christ? Will you commit to that? Yeah. All right. Well, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Being buried in death and being raised to a new life. I want to pray with you guys, and uh, I'll just have something to say briefly right after the prayer. Father, we rejoice. We rejoice at this beautiful picture that you take dead people and you bring them to life through the power of Christ. Lord, I rejoice with my son. I rejoice with my family. I rejoice with my friends. You are so good. Lord, your faithfulness just... As we try to raise our kids the best we can, we just rejoice that you are still doing what you are known to do. You are saving souls. You are bringing them into the kingdom. And I am so happy for my son. I pray, Lord, that you will just continue to help him, to grow him, to build him up as he goes through your word, as he prays, as he commits to helping others, other Christians, other believers who are in his life. And Lord, I pray that you would just do great things in and through his life through the power of Christ. Amen. Um, before we have a time of greeting where everybody gets to get up and greet one another, I do want to invite everybody to the lunch. Like we really celebrate a baptism at our Slavic churches because it's really significant. It's amazing. So in celebration of that, I personally want to invite everybody, guests, everybody, Please, after the service, go downstairs. I know you members have to stay for the members meeting, me included. But thank you guys. Thank you for sharing this with us.
So time of greeting. Go ahead, get up, greet one another in the name of Jesus and get to know one another. All right, let's go ahead and make our way back to our seats, and we'll continue to sing and praise the Lord. Um, the song we're going to do next is um, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. It's a good, um, just a good explanation of the gospel, which we just celebrated as we saw Mark be baptized. So let's sing this together. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand and come behold the wondrous mystery Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. mystery slain by death the god of life but no grave could e'er restrain him praise the lord he is alive what a foretaste of deliverance how unwavering our hope christ in in power resurrected as we will be when he comes amen and we'll continue to sing with i will glory in my redeemer Priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death. My only Savior before the holy judge the lamb who is my righteousness the lamb who is my righteousness i will glory in my redeemer my life he bought, my love he owns. I have no longings for another. I'm satisfied in him alone. I will glory in my Redeemer, his faithfulness, my standing place. Though foes are mighty, rush upon me my feet are firm held by his grace my feet are firm held by his grace I will glory in my redeemer who carries me on eagle's wings he crowns my life with loving kindness his triumph song i'll ever sing i will glory in my redeemer who waits for me at gates of gold and when he calls me it will be His face forever to behold, His face forever to behold.
Our scripture reading this morning is Habakkuk chapter 3. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. Let's pray. O great God, creature and ruler, creator and ruler, Lord, over all things, we are your creatures, Lord. You are sovereign, you are righteous, you are omniscient. Lord, how can we describe you rightly? As we ponder what we've just read here, let us consider Habakkuk's rock-solid confession and trust in you. Sometimes we suffer, sometimes we experience loss, sometimes the tree that is our own lives looks barren and seemingly producing no good fruit. But Lord, you are always working, and you're always working things out according to your will and your good pleasure. And in that truth, Lord, May we have confidence, may we have contentment, and may we have joy. Help us, Lord, not to look upon our own circumstances, but to gaze upon you and the promises of your word. And like Habakkuk, we will say, yes, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Christ is the foundation on which we stand, and come what may, you will be our trust, our strength, and our sure footing. Lord, we thank you also for the ordinance of baptism. What a, a blessing it is, Lord, to see someone make a public profession and testifying of what you have done for them through this beautiful picture of the new life that we have in Christ. We rejoice with Mark and with the whole Maximenko family. And Father, as we come to the preaching of your word, we have great anticipation for what you will say to us today through Paul. Thank you for giving him the mind to have clarity and intention as he brings the word to us. Bless him, Lord, and grant us ears to hear and hearts to receive it with gladness. And we pray these things in Jesus' mighty and matchless name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing one more song, How Firm a Foundation. foundation you saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to Jesus has fled dismay for I am your God and will still give you aid I'll strengthen you help you and cause you to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand deep waters I call you to go the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow for I will be with you your troubles to bless and sanctify to you your deepest distress Your pathway 
grace shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt you, I only design your dross to consume and your gold to refine. that on Jesus has leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Y'all may be seated. Good morning. put my sermon notes in the pulpit and I thought what an awful prank it would be if somebody came up here and swiped them before I came up but they're here um, it is good to be with y'all as always it's so good to see so much of my family my friends just to share this celebration I know I teared up there I'm a sensitive guy y'all may not know that about me but I really am especially just to think about my oldest son and the work that God has done in his life and for us to like witness that day by day and it just I'm rejoicing but hopefully the tears are out hopefully I can preach the message and if we have any interruptions like that I don't apologize for them (laughs) but it has truly been a joy just to hear the different men of the preach church uh, preach the men of the church preach uh, over these last few weeks I mean we got to hear Nathan Jason Tim Peter just bring the word to us and it has blessed me and my family tremendously and now we get to the final part of the rotation and I'm the last one on the list and although that was awesome because it gave me so much time to prepare but that also gave me a lot of time to worry but I don't worry right y'all I heard Peter's sermon do not be anxious for anything but really that actually came to my mind so many times that every time I would begin to get anxious at the task at hand I began to be thankful for the way that God through his spirit is equipping me as somebody to deliver his word. So that message just always came to mind. It's do not be anxious, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And that just drives anxiety far from you. So on to our message. The title of the message is the content of our contentment. I like clever titles for messages. I thought that was clever. But as we work our way to the end of the letter of Apostle Paul to the Philippians, we get to our passage today. We'll be looking at a few verses. Uh, We'll be looking at 10 through 13 specifically, but we'll also go back and reference a good bit of the verses preceding this thought. So Peter last week mentioned that Paul was about to wrap up the epistle. I think it started with the word, finally. And in verse 8, and now we get to verse 10, and it almost seems as if, like, he's starting a whole new thought here. He's, it's like, finally, and then, oh, but. So, he, it, it's as if, like, the plane is circling around the, the airport, getting ready for the landing, and the apostle Paul pulls up on the yokes, gives more throttle, flies back up, and he makes another attempt. And this isn't the first time he's done it. Because back in chapter 3, he, we thought he was about to wrap things up also. It started with finally. But I'm sure we can understand this thought process. We have to realize that this is a letter that the apostle wrote to a church family, to people that he loved and cared for. And as he's writing this out, it's like, oh, yeah, I got to tell him this. So I think we can understand. We're all human, right? It's like us shooting a text to somebody. We shoot a text to them, and as soon as we hit the send button, we're like, oh, yeah, I got I to gotta throw something else in there. I totally forgot. And we do it like five or ten times after that. But as we get to this passage, Paul does kind of change his thoughts in the verses that we're going to be looking at a little bit here. 
They still flow very seamlessly, but he, he even uses the word but. And in the ESV, I think what we'll see up on the screen, it doesn't have that word there, but at the beginning of verse 10 in the original language, there is the word de or but in English. So it's a transition of thought. And this is there not to show us a contrast to what Paul had just been saying. Instead, it is simply introducing a new idea. And here, I really do believe that Paul goes in for the landing with his final words to the Philippians. I'm not going to wrap that up. Nathan's going to get to wrap that up. So uh, excited about that as well. But in chapter 2, verses 25 through 29, I just kind of, it's going to be up on the screen. I think this kind of just helps us to understand this thought that he's transitioning into. So chapter 2 of Philippians, verses 25 through 29, we read, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service for me. So it seems here that the Philippians had sent Epaphroditus to deliver a message to Paul, but also to minister to him in his need. We read later that was in, the, in a form of a gift. So in Philippians 4.18, we read, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that next week. And now Epaphroditus has probably come back with this letter to the church, and it would be fitting for Paul to address the gift and express his gratitude for it. So, as we approach our passage, let's stand out of honor and reverence for the Word of God as we read our passage for today. We stand just to show that we truly believe this is the Word of God. It was as if God was here speaking it to us today. It is found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. If you don't have a Bible with you, we do have the pew Bibles in the seat backs there underneath the seats, and that will be found on page 923. So Philippians 4, 10 through 13. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Remain standing and we'll pray real quick before we get to the message. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for the day that you have made. We do rejoice in it. And Father, I stand before you today as a weak man who is fully relying on your strength. I pray that you would just fill me with power, with boldness to proclaim your word. Lord, you have put this message on my heart, and I cannot deliver it on my own. And I also pray, Lord, for ears to hear and eyes to see the glorious beauty and wonder of your precious word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs> in a conversation I had with a friend, oh, y'all may be seated. In a conversation I had with a friend of mine from an earlier years, was, we began to talk about life and how he was doing. One of the things that kept bringing, he kept bringing up was the realization that as he looked around at the people in his life, they were all doing much better than him. He saw the jobs and the careers that they had developed. He saw the families that they were starting and the joy that they brought to their life. And he saw all these wonderful things that were going on in his friends' lives and family lives members. And he was sad because he felt an absence of all these things. He didn't have these things that he looked around and saw. And this kind of struck me. And I began to talk to him and just kind of encourage him in the Lord the best way I could. But 
I don't think for a moment that he was alone in thinking this way as he observed life and the people around him. I think it would be true to say that many of us in various times of our lives have had similar thoughts. I would even go out on a limb and say that some of us are probably living with those type of thoughts right now. Apostle Paul and the Word of God has a message for all of us today in this passage that we'll spend some time reflecting upon. The main point today will be this. I think we'll have it up on the screen there. The main point, Christian, the outward circumstances you find yourself in should not be the cause of your joy, but we must learn to rejoice in the Lord greatly in spite of those circumstances. Once again, Christian, the outward circumstances you find yourself in should not be the cause of your joy, but we must learn to rejoice in the Lord greatly in spite of those circumstances. And in true preacher fashion, I'll attempt to break down Paul's message for us in three points, all starting with the same letter, at least for the main, main word there. <coughs> Excuse me. The first of the C's is the context of Paul's contentment. So if we go to Philippians 4.10, Apostle Paul says this, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Apostle Paul here starts off with the idea of rejoicing. He has used this phrase repeatedly in the letter to the Philippians. Even in Tim's sermon from a previous week, Paul is rejoicing. In verse 4 of chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And also in chapter 3, verse 1, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And if you go through the book of Philippians, you will see a reoccurring theme of joy, the joy that Paul has and the joy that he calls the Philippians to. And it's a beautiful thing. Again and again, Paul talks about rejoicing in this letter. And it's interesting to note here the circumstances that Paul finds himself in as he writes this letter and these very words. And this kind of goes back to like all the way to the introduction of the letter to Philippians. But where is Paul? Kids, in your bulletins, you have three choices. He's in prison. Paul is in prison when he's writing this letter, and he keeps talking about joy. Paul has been doing everything he can to further the gospel message that he has been appointed by God to preach. It was through Paul that God brought the gospel message to the church in Philippi, and because of his gospel proclamation, he was imprisoned in Philippi. We can read about this in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 11 through 40. We're not going to turn there today, but specifically about the imprisonment in verses 19 through 40. It's also believed that Paul writes this letter about 10 years after his time to his ministry to the Philippians. And the Philippians had supported Paul over the years, but it seems in recent times they lacked an opportunity to continue the support. Now, we'll talk about this in a little bit also, but like we do have to remember where Philippi was and where Paul was at this moment. I think somebody who was preaching on it pulled up a map and we were able to look at it, but I think it's around like 4,000 miles away. So when, they, when, when he's saying you lacked an opportunity, it wouldn't be very easy for somebody just to zip down to Rome and you know, pass Paul a gift. Just as I was Googling the information, you could get a flight now from Philippi to Rome for $75 one way, but I, I'm pretty sure they didn't have that luxury. Um, but Paul even tells them that they do well to share in his trouble. Verse 14, he says, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. From all outwardly circumstances, there should be no reason for rejoicing. I mean, if you just think about it, you're in jail, chained to a Roman guard, 24 hours a day. There's these people you love outside of this world you live in now, and you're writing to them, and you're in these circumstances. But Paul goes on and on about the joy that he has in the Lord in this short letter. Paul is rejoicing in the Lord for a specific reason. In this verse, and it is because the Philippians have revived their concern for him, verse 10. But not so much in the gift itself, and this is important. He's not just rejoicing that they gave him a gift. That's not the point. But what the gift says about the saints there in Philippi, in verse 17 
I know Nathan's going to be speaking on this too, but in verse 17, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. So he was rejoicing at what this gift and what this ministry that they were trying to minister to him with was saying about those people. They wanted to take part in what Paul is doing. Just as Paul has a heart for them, they have a heart for him. And it's beautiful that he talks about this. Now, as I was studying through this, it, it seemed like a really interesting way to thank somebody for a gift. You know, if you want to write a letter and you want to thank somebody for a gift, he has these words in here that just kind of threw up some flags for me. It says, at length, you have revived your concern, like as if they weren't concerned about him before. You had no opportunity, and that was one that caught my eye. Really, like, you had no opportunity? Here I am sitting in jail, chained to a Roman guard, and you guys had no opportunity? Now, we could look at it that way, but... So now at length or at last, it almost sounds like, finally you guys remembered me. But is Paul really being ungrateful here? He goes on in verse 11 to say, not that I speak from want, almost as if he is saying... I really didn't need it anyways. I'm good. And he goes on to say that he has learned to be content in whatever circumstances he is in, as if to say that, hey, even if you didn't send me this gift, I'm all right. I'm happy with where I'm at. I'm content with what I have or don't have in this case. And and you could come to that conclusion, even if you spend some time looking at the, the, the original language and the way it is, like even the word for contentment in verse 11, I'm going to mention this again, but it actually has the idea of self-sufficient, like it's a compound word, and it has this idea of self-sufficiency. Is Paul saying to the Philippians that he is just fine without their gift? We'd be in error to believe that is a thought that Apostle Paul is trying to communicate to these brothers and sisters that he's writing to. If we keep reading, he goes on to praise God for the gift that they have sent. Verse 18, once again, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent me, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. How can we understand what Paul is trying to tell them? If we look at the way Paul presents his thanksgiving to the Philippians, he is doing it in a very gentle way. He wants to thank them for their generosity, but also he doesn't want them to think that by not giving to him, they are in some way neglecting him. And, and I would just like add a little side note here. That is the complete opposite of what we hear in a lot of TV ministries these days. It's send in your money, and if you don't, it's as if they guilt you into doing something that they can benefit from. I think Apostle Paul is actually like really trying to stay away from that idea. He, he's not trying to tell them, hey, guys, like, finally, you sent me some, some, some gift. I'm assuming it's in monetary form, but it's a gift. It was something to bless him with. I don't think he wants the Philippians, who he loves so much, to walk away with that idea where, man... Paul's really struggling. Like, we really, we really got to get him more, more gifts. When Paul uses the word revived or renewed, in some translations, in the original language, it carries the idea of a plant flowering and blossoming again. So, so it's this revived, renewed, it's a plant that is blossoming again. And he is rejoicing in God that their support for his, has blossomed anew. Just remember the circumstances, very far distance. These people obviously love Paul if they are willing to send somebody to travel that far to minister to him in his need. And if we look back at verse 6 in chapter 4, Paul has just got done telling them to be anxious for nothing. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. That's Philippians 4.9. So he has just admonished them to practice the things that they see in him. And now he does not want to make it seem like he's not content with this situation. I mean, imagine, like, guys, like, you need to send me a gift, 
And then he's like, hey, don't be anxious for anything. So we have to follow the thought. He's telling him, don't be anxious for anything. Guys, it's okay. I'm happy with, that you were able to minister to me, but that's not where my happiness comes from. And we'll get to that. He thanks them for their generous gift, but he wants them to know that although he is truly blessed by the gift, he has something much greater to rejoice about. The gift itself was not the cause of Paul's rejoicing or contentment. And we get to our second C. So the first one, the, the context of Paul's contentment, and the second one, the contentment that Paul has learned. And we'll read verses 11 through 12. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Verse 11, Apostle Paul talks about how he has learned to be content in whatever circumstances he is in. Now, the question, I think, begs to be asked, what is contentment? Like, can we get a definition of what contentment is? Because, you know, that may look different depending on who defines it. So the world may have its definition of what it means to be content. And, and sometimes it's interesting to look at how the world defines contentment. So Oxford language definition says this, a state of happiness and satisfaction. Wikipedia, obviously one of the most reliable sources out there, says this, Contentment is an emotional state of satisfaction that can be seen as a mental state drawn from being at ease in one situation, body, and mind. I don't know about y'all, that was a bunch of mumbo-jumbo for me. It's hard to decipher what that even says. It goes on to say, it could be a state of having accepted one situation. Now, this is from the world. I want to be clear. Like, this is people from the world speaking about what contentment is. Now, in not all the sermons I've ever preached, but in some of the sermons I've preached, I love to incorporate Yahoo Answers. Does anybody even remember Yahoo anymore? <laughs> Google has dominated, but Yahoo Answers, I, I, I always preface it saying this, always entertaining, but rarely informative. But I think they hit something here that I'm about to share with y'all. It's really interesting. <coughs> Many of us, <clears throat> I think it's up on the screen, yep. Many of us try to find people or things that will make us happy. We try to outsource the task. As a result, we often feel disappointed or upset when a relationship or a new opportunity doesn't move the needle from dissatisfied to satisfied with our overall existence. But no thing or person can make us happy. Happiness is an inside job. Now, guys, this is just Yahoo Answers. <laughs> but also, I have no idea what the author, I don't know who the author is, I tried to find it, but the author of that quote had in mind when they said happiness is an inside job. I don't know. And it may very well be something totally different than what I would see in it, but I think he makes a good point when he says happiness is an inside job. I thought that was pretty cool. So, let's see what Apostle Paul has to say about this topic. I love how Apostle Paul says he has learned to be content in whatever circumstances he is in. Apostle Paul had to learn this. And if Apostle Paul had to learn something, I think we do too. So, verse 12 says, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity in and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I mean, that's amazing. Like, it, it seems that regardless of Paul's circumstances, he has learned to be content. The original word here, like I said earlier, has this idea of self-sufficient. In the original language, it applies the idea of sufficiency or possessing enough to need no aid. Now, we could get carried away with that. That's not, he's not trying to say like, hey, I have everything in me as a man, Paul, that I'm fine. That's not where he's going with it. But 
An even better expression in the original language is this, independent of external circumstances. Wearsby adds that the word content actually means contained. You think about like content, the content of something, what's contained in it. So it describes a man whose resources are within him, also known as the Spirit of God for the Christian. This goes back to the idea mentioned earlier about happiness being an inside job. What Paul was not saying is that he is good in and of himself. We'll speak more on that in just a little bit. What he is saying is that he is not relying on outward circumstances for his contentment or joy. One other very important thing I would like to note here. Once again, Paul has learned to be content. It's amazing just to think about how Apostle Paul has gotten about learning to be content. So just think with me for a moment as, as the scripture passage gets put up on the screen, what Apostle Paul has gone through to learn this type of contentment. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28, just follow along as I read. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I have received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes last, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Talk about a hard lesson to learn. And sometimes we think we have it bad when our cable internet isn't working or we want an alarm keypad on the back of the building. <laughs> Inside joke. But Apostle Paul was beaten. He was run out of cities, imprisoned, stoned, shipwrecked, wrongly accused, betrayed by his friends. But this is what taught him. This is how he learned to be content. Now, don't, understand, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Paul is not rejoicing in all of these scenarios. He was not passively going along for the ride. I'm good. Paul prayed for the exact opposite of these things to happen. He prayed for God to deliver him from the thorn in the flesh that we read about. He prayed to travel to certain cities that God closed the door on. I don't think for a moment that Paul was hoping to be sitting in a jail cell writing letters to his brothers and sisters that he loves. Please understand, Paul was not rejoicing in the circumstances. He has learned to rejoice in the Lord in spite of the circumstances. He has learned to be content because he realizes that all of these worldly struggles are but a momentary affliction that he must endure. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 7 through 10 and 16 through 18. It says this, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. And therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is dying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day for momentary light afflictions producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I hope you guys caught that. 
He said light momentary affliction, describing all the stuff that we just read that he went through. Light momentary affliction. Let's put that into perspective. Christian, brother and sister, God has not called you to a place of passivity. He has not called you to a position of complacency with your life and where you're at. Again and, again and again, we are commanded in scriptures to pursue, to seek, to strive, to obey, to believe. Paul was not rejoicing in those circumstances. He was rejoicing through those circumstances. So, I think it's really important to know, Paul is not saying, be happy with where you're at. A lot of times we look at contentment that way. And when we want to encourage people to be content, we just want to tell them, hey, just, just be happy where you're at. You know, like God has you there for a reason, and he does. But it's not just be happy where you're at. What Paul is saying is that he has matured in the faith. He has learned as God, has, as God has worked on him and taught him the better way. Paul is content or self-sufficient with whatever God is doing in and through his life. Paul believes in a God who is sovereign. Paul understands the idea of, hey, be happy where you're at. He gets it. A, a God who has a, appointed all things for the good of his children and for his glory Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are, call, are called according to his purpose. And Paul realizes that it is not the outward things that ever make him content, but the inward spirit within him that helps him to know that God is doing something great in and through all the circumstances. A gentleman by the name of Dwight Pentecost says this, and I thought it was a good quote. It's a little lengthy, but just follow along. It's pretty simple. Air and water are two entirely different elements or spheres, and it is impossible to have a vessel filled with air and water at the same time. One that is filled with air must have the air displaced in order to be filled with water. Similarly, if a man's life is given over to the pursuit of material things, that life cannot be filled with Jesus Christ. Until that love for material things is displaced, that life cannot and will not be filled with Christ. When a man gives himself to the pursuit of all that is involved in this world and makes its position and its material, things, his goal and his standard and the center of his life, he will not find the satisfaction that comes from making Jesus Christ the center of his life. To be content is the opposite of to be covetous, to be greedy, to be worldly, to be materialistic. The reason material things can never make a man content is that a man is never able to get enough of them to satisfy him. I thought that was good. Let me ask you a question. Have you been seeking after the things that the world has to offer? Do you find yourself thinking, if only God would, dot, dot, dot? Do you constantly imagine how life would be if only I would have this or that? If I only get that job, if I only find the perfect one to marry, you can't because I already married her, just saying. <laughs> if only my marriage would look different, if only my children would be this way or that way, if only the political tide would change, if only enter your thoughts here. But what Apostle Paul is saying is that his contentment or joy comes from something that is within. It is an inside job, not on the outward things. He is not relying on the things or circumstances that come his way to feel contentment. Consider verse 12 with me again. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. It seems that he is unaffected in his joy by any circumstances. July 23rd was one of the happiest days of my life in the year 2005. I stood before my friends, my family, bunch of people that I didn't know, and I got married. So we just celebrated our anniversary, 17 years together. Praise the Lord for that. But we took vows one to another, 
And I think it's interesting when we think about this idea of contentment, like even in marriage, and I'm talking like even secular marriages, they still say vows and they resemble something along these lines I'm about to read. In the name of God, I blank take you to be my wife, husband, wife slash husband to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until, until parted by death. Isn't it interesting that marriage has this kind of idea of, hey, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. You've promised and you've vowed to do something regardless of those things right? And marriage is an illustration of the love of Christ for his bride, the church. Our love for our spouse is unconditional. It ought not to be affected by any outward circumstance. We vowed this. Our love for our spouses should be an inside job. It doesn't matter what she does or doesn't do for me. It doesn't matter. Set those outside things aside. You have vowed to love her for better, for worse, richer, poorer, sickness, health, you name it. And that's the love that the Father shows us. 1 John 4.19 says this, we love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. We love our spouses because we have been loved by God, not because of how well they love us, what they are able to give us. We love them because we have the love of the Father in us. Peter read in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. I love how Habakkuk the prophet brings out this illustration. I think it ties in directly to what Apostle Paul is saying. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. As bad. In an agrarian society, that's bad. I know none of you guys would be concerned about most of this stuff because we're not relying on it for our sustenance and livelihood. But that's a bad place to be right here. You have nothing. The for better or for worse, this is the worst. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. With the prophet Habakkuk and with Apostle Paul, I choose to rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Is that a resolve you can make today? Circumstances aside, you have a God. You know a God that loves you, that cares for you, and you can rejoice in that. And he is our strength. It doesn't matter your circumstances. It doesn't matter what your trial is. As Christians, we have been promised trial and tribulation. It's not a matter of if, but when. If you are following Christ, you will face adversity. Acts chapter 5, verses 40 through 43. At this, they yielded to Gamaliel. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and released them. The apostles left the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they had been counted worthy of suffering, disgrace for the name. Every day in the temple courts and from house to house, they did not stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. They rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer. I wish we would look at things that way sometimes. I wish I would look at things that way sometimes. But they rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus Christ. Christians, if you are in Christ and your circumstances are not ideal or maybe not even comfortable, or maybe your circumstances are horrible, maybe they are the worst, do not seek joy from these things. Your circumstances are temporary. They are not what defines who you are. They are not the cause of true joy. Now... That being said, I need to issue a word of warning or clarification. Remember when I mentioned that Apostle Paul saying he has learned to be content in all circumstances was not a call to passivity? We we need to recognize and acknowledge that if we are the cause of our bad circumstances and we can do something about it, 
we ought to do something about it. And this principle is highlighted in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. Servants, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but even to those who are unreasonable. For if anyone endures the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God, this is to be commended. Now, how is it to be to your credit if you are beaten for doing wrong and you endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Now, I realize this is taken out of the context of the master-slave relationship back in those days and obedience, and obedience to authority, but the principle applies here. It, what, what Peter was trying to say here is, hey, like, it's commendable if you suffer for doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing, and you suffer for it. That's commendable. But what credit is it to you if you're doing bad and you get punished? I mean, that's not commendable. If we, you, are suffering in your circumstances because of the foolish and bad decisions on our parts, then do something about it. This is not a call to be content because of your wrong, bad, or even sinful situation or decision. We are not to be content with our own sinful ways or habits. Paul is not teaching this. If you're struggling with some besetting sin issue, don't be content with that. Don't be happy with where you're at. If you're going through a season of tough financial times and it's because you're being lazy and don't want to work to provide, don't be content with that. If your children are disobedient, unruly, and it's because you're not spending the time to teach, instruct, and correct them and point them to Jesus, don't be happy with that. That's not the contentment he's talking about here. If your marriage is strained or fallen apart, and it's because of your own sinful choices or selfish attitudes towards your spouse, Paul is not calling you to be content with that. If you are youth and you're struggling with lust or sinful desires, if you're an adult and you're struggling with these same things, and it's because you are not in the Word of God and not renewing your mind with the Word and prayer daily, you better not be content with that. That's not the contentment he's speaking of. If you're on bad terms with another brother or sister, if there is strain in your relationship, if you are not seeking your good and their good in that and being selfish and proud or talking behind one another's back, don't be content with this. Brother and sister, if any one of those scenarios describes you, repent. Repent now. Confess your sins before our holy God and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you are suffering in your own Christian walk because of the bad choices and sinful actions and thoughts you allow into your life and mind, don't take this the wrong way, but you ought to suffer. You've made some bad decisions. Choices have consequences. We all know that. This is God's way of chastising you because he loves you, because you are his child. If God is disciplining you for something you have done wrong, don't be content with the wrong. You be content with the fact that God is turning you to Scripture, turning you to prayer, turning him back to himself. It is not to your credit if you suffer for your foolish decision. This is not commendable before God. This is just a reward for your decision. Do not be content in a sinful and selfish lifestyle. The every circumstances that Paul talks about does not encompass this. Do not take these verses out of context to make them say that we ought to be happy with whatever lot in life God has given us, as if it's some kind of excuse to wallow in the sad state of Christian immaturity that we sometimes find ourselves in. This is not a let go and let God passage. Just be happy with what you got. This is not an excuse for not seeking the face and will of God daily. This is not an excuse for a sinful lifestyle. This is Apostle Paul showing to the Philippians that he has put into practice the very things that he is calling on them to practice. Paul has made multiple appeals for the Philippians to rejoice. He has just called on them to be anxious for nothing. He has just called on them to practice the things they have learned and received and heard and seen in him. They know who Paul is. They know the suffering and the difficult times he has endured. They know the needs he has. 
And most importantly, they know that all of this was because Paul has been faithfully following Jesus and doing the work of the ministry. But also, let's realize the most important thing about Paul's rejoicing. Our third point, the content of Paul's contentment. Apostle Paul is not just rejoicing. He is rejoicing in the Lord. And finally, we get to chapter 4, verse 13, and I think everybody knows this verse. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Or from a different translation, we get the text this way. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Both of those are very fitting. They're obviously both right. They portray the same idea. Now, this has got to be one of the most quoted verses in our society these days. I say one of, there's a lot of them. And I would even say secular society, not Christians. We typically see it on all types of sports apparel, on t-shirts, we see it on motivational advertising, energy drinks, you name it. Something difficult to do, you can see that passage right there, I can do all things through Christ. I was going to wear my t-shirt, my sneakers, autograph, with that passage on it, I didn't think it would look right. Nathan was going to let me borrow his mug that says I can do all things through a Bible verse out of context. But, but that's kind of how the world uses this passage. And, and I hope you guys are getting a better idea of what Paul is actually talking about. Like, this isn't an, a universal call that says I can do anything and everything I want to just because Jesus got my back. But... We'll talk a little bit more on that in a minute. This is obviously a gross caricature of what the verse is saying. I find it absolutely silly to claim such a thing when it comes to a sporting event. Like, to me, it just, it always boggles my mind. Like, imagine one boxer enters the ring and he's wearing this I can do all things through Christ t-shirt, and the other guy enters the ring and he's wearing the same t-shirt. I mean, guys, you see how now, yeah. I hope one of those is willing to graciously lose through Christ who gives him strength. But I'm pretty sure we can see the absurdity of taking it that way. Um, when we use Philippians 4.13 in a name it, claim it kind of way, you are missing the point of the passage. Most of the time, the whole verse isn't even quoted. Usually it just says, I can do all things through Christ. That's it. That's what we get. Or even better, I can do all things. Philippians 4.13. That's not what it says. It's a famil familiar verses tend to have this effect on people. When a secular society gets a hold of an amazing biblical truth, they will take it, pervert it, and market it to their benefit. They will carnalize, and yes, I made that word up because I can. They will carnalize the truth and turn it into something that appeals to the fleshly man. It's been done so with so many other passages. I mean, think about this, for example. And God made man in his own image. How many times have we heard the prosperity gospel preachers, the little God theology preachers, using that to say that they are somehow little gods? How about Psalm 23, one of our most beloved psalms? As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And it stops there. Has someone, has, has somehow become a comforting thing to people who do not know the Lord or much less fear him? They have left off the very next thought many times, which clearly says, for you are with me. The whole world knows that the Bible says, do not judge lest you be judged, while completely ignoring the fact that the God of the universe is a holy God who will judge the world in righteousness. Now, in all fairness, I want to shed light on the fact that even when somebody is wearing a jersey with I can do all things through Christ on it, they are saying something that is very true. They are. Even someone who does not know Christ can claim this passage. And it's true. Now, before you guys pick up the stones in the corner to stone me and deem me a heretic, let me explain. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 45, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Isaiah 42, 5 says this, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. Acts chapter 17, verse 25 says this, 
nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Now let me make this clear as I can. I believe that in this room, there's only two types of people, only two. The way Jesus put it, the just and the unjust, the way I would say it, the saved and the unsaved. This passage has a message for both groups. Let me address those of you who find yourself outside of Christ Jesus. You do not know the Lord. You do not know Jesus Christ. You are not trusting in Him. The very next breath that you take has only been given to you by the grace of Almighty God. And in that sense, you only can take the next breath through the power of Christ. So in that sense, it's true. If you're sitting here today and find yourself outside of Christ, the only reason you are still breathing and your heart is still beating is because of the common grace that we just read about of God that is poured out among all flesh. Don't let this be a comfort to you. Let this be a time where you are aware of the fact that God has given you one more breath and one more heartbeat for a purpose. God has given you an opportunity to come to him and acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior. If you're a non-believer, and by that I mean if you are not fully trusting in Christ for your eternal salvation, today is the day. Today is the day of your salvation. You know that nothing in this world will bring you contentment. You keep striving and turning to things that leave you empty and void of true joy. You chase after the things the world has to offer, like Solomon, the wisest guy. He said, it's like chasing after the wind. Have any of you caught the wind yet? You just continue to strive for the next thing and are left empty and unsatisfied. If this is you, and you know that you are not trusting in Christ and trusting in the sufficiency of Christ to satisfy you, I need to tell you something. You will never be happy apart from Christ. You will never be content with your circumstances. You will never be satisfied with what you have and where you're at. What you need in your life is not another raise, another promotion, a better marriage, financial success, a better car, a nicer house, you name it. None of those things will make you happy or joyful. You need the saving power of Jesus. You need salvation. You need to accept the fact that you are a sinner that has thoughts and desires that are against God. You crave and desire things that go contrary to the Word of God. You are chasing after things that make you an idolater. You are putting things and worshiping things above God. The message for you today is this. Repent. Turn from your idolatry. Turn from your sinful, fleshly desires and turn to Christ. The gospel message is this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All people need to repent and turn from their wicked ways. And you may be saying, I'm not wicked. I try to do the best I can. Allow me to quote the prophet Isaiah when he says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment or filthy rags. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Your best deeds are filthy rags. And I'm not talking to just the person who's an unbeliever that's living a wicked, immoral lifestyle. I'm talking to you who's in the pews, and who is trusting in anything other than Jesus Christ, his shed blood and sacrifice on the cross to save you. You you could be involved in ministry. You could be singing songs up here on the stage. You, You could be doing whatever service you think you're doing to the Lord. And if you are trusting in that to get you there one day, I could just picture it. You stand before God on judgment day, and you're like, here's all these rags. Can I wear them in there? No. No, you can't. Because the Bible says, and it talks about the wedding garments that we are to wear to that celebration. And it's not something that we fabricate on our own. It is the righteousness of Christ that we are robed in. 
And if that's you today, and you're sitting there, and you have been trusting in anything other than Jesus Christ and his sacrificial work on the cross for your salvation, please talk to me. Please talk to one of the guys out here. We would love to tell you more about the gospel message. The only thing you can do is acknowledge that you are a sinner. You do not measure up to the holiness of God. You lack the righteousness that God requires. And then, and only then, when you acknowledge those things, you begin to see the beauty of the gospel. Jesus lived a life that you can never live. He was sinless. He was spotless. He came to be the righteous one. He came to fulfill the will of God perfectly. He came to be the sacrifice. He died the death that you and I deserve. And sacrifice, you may ask? Sacrifice for what? The Bible teaches that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin or forgiveness of sin. In the Old Testament, there was the sacrifice of animals, and as the blood was poured out, it was the blood that covered the sins. But it has to be done repeatedly, because the blood of animals was never meant to take away the sins or the punishment that we deserve. Simply, it meant to cover or atone for it. But it had to be done repeatedly. But, but God... God sent his perfect, sinless, spotless son to take on him the sins of the world, the perfect lamb of God. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In Hebrews 10, 8 through 10, it says, "When, When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Trust in Jesus today. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Stop looking to yourself or things this world has to offer to bring you joy or satisfaction. Over and over this has been proven to leave people empty and void. Trust in Jesus. Trust in his finished work on the cross. Trust that he alone can make you happy and accept the gift of salvation. And why I keep using the word happy, I just want to explain myself. Like, when I say happy, I don't mean a smile on your face and you're just externally happy. I'm talking about joy. And it's true joy. It's the joy of the Lord. I hope you guys understand that. I'm not just talking about being happy. And for the believer, I say this. Do you find yourself content with Christ? Does your joy come from knowing Christ and being in Him? Do your circumstances determine your joy? Or are you resting in the finished work of Christ? Are you finding joy and contentment in who you are in Christ? Let me read from 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, and I know I'm like, I'm almost done, guys. Let me read from 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 19. Lengthy passage, but listen to what Paul's instructions are here. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And listen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to, be, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with, ever, with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. 
thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. This is the only source of joy, true joy, pure joy, the joy that we have in Christ, the joy we find in the God of our salvation. Christian, let me admonish you today. Paul has said multiple times in this letter to the churches to imitate him as he imitates Christ. You want to know somebody who is content under difficult circumstances? Yes, Paul is a great example. But let's turn our eyes to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Talking, talk about knowing abundance and knowing need. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but he came down from heaven and took on the flesh of a man as a baby. Poor family. He left heaven, the glory and splendor of heaven, and came to earth. He was content with that. He did it willingly. He did it lovingly. He even did it joyfully. He got to serve creation. He has the heavenly home, but he also had no place to lay his head. He had abundance of food, but he was hungry. When they asked him about him being hungry, he said, hey, where's, where is my food? The word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. On the cross, he asked for a drink, and he was mocked for it. Jesus is our example, and we as Christians who are in him can do all things he has called us to do through the power of his strength. The all things in verse 13 does not speak of all the carnal and fleshly things that we want to accomplish but I really actually believe that references back to verse 8 that Peter preached on. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovable, whatever is of good repute, ponder on these things. These are some of the things we can do through Christ who strengthens us and that we ought to do through Christ who strengthens us. And we can only do these things through Christ. We will only be content in Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. The true content, content of Paul's contentment is Christ. And that ought to be the only source of contentment we seek. My friend from the beginning of the sermon was looking at others and feeling a sense of lack and dissatisfaction. I encouraged him to look to Christ for his satisfi satisfaction, not to look to his circumstances to make him happy. It seems so simple. It, it seems so basic. But it is something that we many times neglect to do. When he began to look at Christ, my friend, and seek his kingdom and his will in his life and trust in the plan and purpose Christ had for him, it all began to make sense. When Christ takes, our li takes over our lives, when he becomes our all in all, when we think of him more than we think of ourselves, we have no room for being discontent. When, when we begin to grasp the goodness of God and just be thankful for it, and the many ways he shines his light upon us daily, we have no, no room for grumbling or discontentment. And also, as we make our requests known to God by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we are not to be anxious. But I think the key here is thanksgiving, like Peter said, are you thankful for what God is doing in your life? Are you thanking him daily for his goodness and grace in your life? That is an attitude and perspective that will create in us a content heart in the Lord. I think of many of us are the same way. We become disillusioned and we look to the world to find contentment in it. But we must trust in the word of God and daily redirect our minds and hearts to focus on the true source of joy and contentment through the power of Christ who strengthens us. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for you. We rejoice in you. We find our hope, our strength, our joy in you and you alone. Father, if there's anybody in this room today that does not know you, I pray, Lord, that you would work through the power of the Holy Spirit and just convict them. Lord, press upon them the truths of your holy, perfect word. 
And Lord, help them to look to Christ, the perfect, spotless, sinless lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And Lord, for those of you who trust in you, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to daily walk through your power, through your strength. Help us not to lean on our own understanding, our own strengths, our own hopes, our own desires. But Lord, help us to align our will with you and help us to live for your glory and for your kingdom purposes here on earth. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Stand and sing. We'll sing, yet not I, but through Christ in me. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing All is mine, yet not I But through Christ in me The night is dark But I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior, He will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley He will lead. Oh, the night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and never is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. Till I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through in me to this I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat 
yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. I just want to thank all of you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. What a joy and just what a blessing it's been. <clears throat> Your benediction comes actually from Philippians 4, 8 and 13. May you dwell on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, on excellent things, on things worthy of praise, and may you do it in the power of Christ that is in you and working through you. Amen. Just a reminder, we have a members meeting right after the service, but all the guests, everybody, please make it down to the basement. There's food there, refreshments, and then anybody else, everybody else, please, we're going down there afterwards as far as members go, and please have a good time. Thank you so much. God bless you.